This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 192. Today, CJ and I are going to share some Microsoft and Azure related news from the cloud. We're also going to talk about some special giveaways for episode 200, recorded live May the 4th. May the 4th be with you, 2017. What if you could take any process your teams use to get work done and make it happen automatically? What if you could save countless hours and help people work better together? Nintex can make that happen. With the Nintex platform, work flows from person to person, system to system, to the cloud and back. And it flows in and out of the tools that you use every day. With Nintex, work flows so your teams can work smarter, work faster, and be more connected than ever. Good morning, CJ. (laughs) (laughs) We're past May the 4th, but uh, hey, once people hear this, but hey, we're recording on May the 4th, so we're going to take advantage of it. I feel you, my son. (laughs) I hope not. (laughs) It's just dawned on me. We've had we've got May the fourth at Star Wars Day. Da da da! You didn't even see my Facebook. Oh, I guess that's right. You're taking a Facebook hiatus, so you didn't see my picture. I'm taking a Facebook hiatus off my phone. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so I'm allowed to go on Facebook on my PC, but I was sick of the intrusion and the addictiveness of of the addictiveness of it on my phone so I got rid of it yeah I a couple a uh, while ago I hit the um, turned off all notifications for mm-hmm. Facebook on my mm-hmm. phone mm-hmm. including the badge number and then every once in a while it's like when I feel like like okay I'll go check but at least there's no temptation of a little red circle on the app that says you know hey you get this many unreads or something like that so I think I'll probably end up in the same boat I went through and turned off all the notifications for pretty much every app except the ones that I really count on mm. And, or need notifications for like email or what have you. And it's pretty liberating, but I'll probably end up with it back on my phone at some point, but just with all the notifications off. I think that's probably the mm. better solution long term. I actually I don't even have notifications on for my email, but I just don't get much email anymore. It's pretty sweet. Oh, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, so uh, this is your first day back from your vacation st- time in uh, Italy. How was it? Brilliant. I absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was a loaded question because I saw the picture, so I knew it was brilliant. Oh, dude, it was so relaxing and so nice, and my wife and I had such a great time. We were uh, very, very happy and uh, obviously happy to get home and see our children again and things, but we were very lucky to get the time away, and we had a blast. It was a really fun time. Mm. We went to Rome, down to Naples, Capri, Positano on the Amalfi Coast, and hung out there, Pompeii. It was really nice. Lots of old stuff. <laughs> a, you know, you know, you go to a place like Rome, and everywhere you turn, there's things that are just unfathomably old. Yeah. Oh, by the way, this is the square where Caesar died, and you're like, oh snap, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I studied a lot of a lot of Latin at school and things like that, and I, you know, did a lot of things on Pompeii and the Roman Empire and things, and. It's all just theory. And then you go visit these places and you're like, wow, this is just, I know it sounds really naive and silly, but it's just mind bending. Like a lot of the world has no concept of how old some of these things are. When I come from a country that's only a couple of hundred years old, and same with the States, really, it's only a few hundred years old, the modern version of the States anyway. And then you go to a place where it's like, oh, and this, you know, lamppost or whatever was from like 2,000 years before Christ. <laughs> you're like, wow, that's pretty old. <laughs> yeah, just a bit, yeah. It puts in perspective all the stuff that, you know, that I, I think the United States, like I live, in this, I live in the oldest city in the United States. It's like, yeah, that's um, thousands of years older than some of the stuff that you saw on your vacation. Wow. Yeah, it's not say. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah, it's been, uh, we were holding the fort down while you were gone, so I'm glad you had a good time. And uh, we had some news from, you know, Docker released a bunch of stuff at their DockerCon conference, and yeah. I covered some of the news from that. I know you you said that you, I was talking before, with you before the show, you've played with some of the stuff that, um, that Docker came out with. Uh, that week or announced at the at DockerCon um, that's related to Azure. You want to tar- share a little bit of that with our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So Docker have been doing a lot of work with Microsoft recently, as we've covered on the show in the past. And one thing in particular they've been working on is making it really easy to get up and running in Azure with a Docker Swarm. And so they've been working on Docker for Azure, which in a nutshell gives you the ability to provision swarms in Azure Really simply, right? It's all done with an ARM template behind the scenes, but they sort of make all that 
easy. So you don't have to know about ARM templates or anything like that. You can say, hey, I want to provision a new swarm. You give it you know, a resource group name in Azure where you want it provisioned. You say how many worker nodes you want and how many master nodes you want and what VM sizes you want those things to be and a couple of other parameters, and then you hit go. And then a few minutes later, you've got a, a Docker swarm up and running in Azure, natively in Azure, I should say. And by that, what I mean is like when you scale up the worker nodes through Docker, through Docker Swarm, it interacts with virtual machine scale sets in mm -hmm. Azure and to scale up the worker nodes that you need and things like that. So it's got native integration with Azure to do that sort of infrastructure level kind of work. Same thing goes for when you, you know, you might spin up a container that has a website in it or an API, right? An HTTP endpoint of some description. Docker Swarm will communicate with Azure and say, hey, They've got this new application that's published on this port. Go configure it with the the firewall and the the networking rules to publish that endpoint externally, mm. if that's what you want to do, obviously. And then you make all the routing and all the make sure all the requests end up at your container inside the swarm. So it's really nice, really really nice. There are also Docker Cloud are adding support for swarm mode that's currently in beta, where you'll be able to manage these swarms from Docker Cloud whether they exist in AWS or in or in Azure, for example, or bring your own swarm as well. Mm. And then the Docker client for Mac OS and Windows has the the edge version of it, which is kind of like the the insider release, I guess, for want of a better word. You know, it's kind of like the the hot version of the client coming out. That has the ability to connect to those swarms. So if you're a Docker Cloud customer and you connect a swarm into Docker Cloud and say register the swarm or you create the Swarm through Docker Cloud, your Docker client on your laptop or whatever detects where those swarms are. And so if you want to grab a console on one of those swarms in the Docker Cloud agent, you just say, hey, here are my swarms. You click on it, boom, you've got a terminal window straight into your swarm. Oh, that's really slick. And it wires up all the networking. It SSHs in across things for you, does the whole nine yards, and you're in. And um, you don't have to dick around with all of that stuff. That is really slick. That yeah. is really slick. I'm going to do a blog post about it soon, but in a little video showing how it works. But it's pretty cool. Oh. A lot of it's in beta. The Docker Cloud stuff's in preview for swarm mode. And then their ability to provision new swarms in Azure from the Docker Cloud website is um, is currently in a beta preview that I'm on. So um, you won't see that show up yet. But it's really nice, man. It's like single click, be able to create a swarm in Azure. It connects with your Docker client on your local dev box, which means you can be building your app using you know, a compose file or whatever, and then compose up into that swarm mm. in Azure, and it's seamless. Mm. That's really slick. That's yeah. very, very slick. It's really cool. Very cool, man. So that's what I've been playing with. How about you? Where are you at? You're not in town. I'm not in town. Yeah, you, listeners can't see it, but you can see the background. I'm in a, a glorious hotel room. Yeah, it's one of those, it's one of those sort of generic beige <laughs> hotel room backgrounds that I have no idea where you really are. <laughs> this is not my office. Yeah. It is yeah. this week, I guess. I'm in Chicago. I'm attending, well, I'm presenting at the GoTo conference. I've never, I've never been involved in this conference in the past, but they asked me to come and do a uh, full day workshop. And yesterday I did a full day workshop on uh, working with Angular. So it was titled Angular 2, but we talked a lot about Angular 4 as well. So working with Angular, and we built a, the whole day was, I guess, the beginning, first quarter of the day was kind of getting your sea legs, understanding what is Angular, how to, what are the main control pieces to it. If you did Angular 1, here's what's different, here's what's easier, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we dove in and started building an app. And I, you might like it. The, the, I decided people are going to learn something about the Apollo program and building the app. And so I built these giant JSON array or JSON objects as my quote unquote, you know, simple JSON database for the entire Apollo program. Also all the crew members that were involved with pictures of mission patches, pictures from the, of each one of the crew, links to their wiki pages, their role on the, on each one of the flights and all of the vehicles that made up, including the model numbers for like the lunar module and the command service module and all that stuff. And people were like, wait a minute, where's Apollo 2, 3, 2 and 3? Like, there was no Apollo 2 and 3. It's like, what are those three other, you know, flights before Apollo 1? I'm like, well, those were when they were testing Saturn 4. I'm like, I didn't realize that that was all going on. Like, ha, ha you learned Angular and the Apollo program. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, 
Is it time for picks yet? Oh, <laughs> getting there. I, okay, so <laughs> there, we're going to have to, we're, we're probably going to share the same picks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're going to get yeah, there. But we'll get it. hey, there are two things that you and I want to cover in this show. And before we do it, though, we want to, I want to first say, uh, welcome uh, a new sponsor to the show uh, that's coming on. You'll hear them coming up on the next episode, but very much, you know, we've got to, we now, I think we're up to like four or five sponsors on the show. I know that, you know, CJ and I are very sensitive to the fact that we do not want, you know, the show to be littered with advertisements. We don't want to, to annoy our listeners by having lots of advertisements, but we are, so we're, we do take great care and not just saying anybody that wants to advertise, we, you know, come on in. And if you support the show and sponsor the show, then we'll let you in. We've had a bunch of inquiries. We appreciate all of the inquiries, but we want to make sure that, you know, it is that the um, spots that people put on the show, they're applicable to our audience. They also help support the show. They help pay the bills for the show because this isn't exactly a cheap thing that you and I end up doing. But we also want to make sure that, you know, it, it doesn't detract from the show. I listen to other podcasts where they just seem to just chop out in the middle of the show and say, let's just throw an interview or a sponsor spot in here. And we're trying to be very selective about it. We're, we're trying to be very, very sensitive to everybody's, everybody's requirements and needs for it and what you would want to show. So, um, hmm. we're working hard at it and just appreciate all of our, all of our sponsors. Yeah, absolutely. And make, making sure they're kind of relevant to our audience, obviously. Yep. So, hey, before, before we dump into all, all our stuff though, yeah. I want to keep, guess, let me get, we're going to do a little teaser here. Before we do the news, I want to extend the thing that I talked about in the last episode. We're talking about episode 200. You and I have come up with some stuff. And so we're going to roll one of our sponsor spots right now to help pay some bills. But then you want to stick around because I'm going to tell you how you can win a Surface laptop or one of two Xboxes you and I are going to give away. Ooh. We'll be right back. ShareGate makes it easier for organization to adopt and use the latest Microsoft productivity tools helping millions of users be happier and more productive at work. ShareGate is trusted by over 10,000 IT admins from over 110 countries to manage, migrate, and secure their SharePoint and Office 5 environments. ShareGate is recognized as the must-have tool for day-to-day -day administration of on-premises, cloud, and hybrid environments. Interested in learning more? Check us out at ShareGate.com to learn how ShareGate can make you more productive. All right, CJ. Last week when you were gone, I told our listeners the following. What did you commit us to? I said, what have you done? <laughs> I, well, wait until you see it. Well, there's some, first of all, I don't know if you've listened to the episode that you, uh, that from uh, when you were gone. Have you listened to episode 190 or 191 yet? Not yet. No, I've got it queued up on my phone. Yeah, I can tell you haven't because you haven't texted me yet. I'm sure I will know. I'm sure I will find out when you actually do it. <laughs> Excellent. And don't worry, I didn't share all of the story. But there is a part of a story which I'm sure when I start telling it, you're gonna, your eyes are gonna light up like, oh my god, I hope you don't tell the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice, perfect. Anyway, I will make sure I do that. And probably Jeremy Fake and Ryan Duguid will probably think the same thing if they listen to it as well. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> hey, but what I told everybody was I said, hey, you know, we got episode 200 coming up. When it was episode yep. 100, you and I, you know, turned over the mics to our wives and let them go. So we've done that. Can't do that again. Maybe we'll do it again in the future, but we can't do that again right now. Yeah. 200 so is like, a massive milestone. Yeah. And so we got to think of, we have to think of something different. So I've got to, I've got something that I want to do. I'm going to share, I'm going to save it and pop it on you when we, uh, when we actually record episode 200. But I told everybody, I said, Hey, what we would like to do is make this a lot about, you know, thank you to everybody that's listening to the show that you guys have helped really make this possible. All the guys and gals that are listening to the show and tune in every week. We wanted to, to get your two cents on, you know, what, what has the show been like for you? And so CJ and I have come up with a way to kind of entice you to send us some stuff. So let me explain what it is. And CJ is going to tell you what you can get for doing this. So what we're going to have, there are going to be a couple of requirements here. We're going to run these until May the 26th. That's Friday, May the 26th. And your submissions have to be in by then in order to make episode 200. First of all, you must be on our mailing list. So if you go to the MicrosoftCloudShow.com, there's a link on there for the mailing list to sign up for the mailing list, or there is a little widget that should pop up at the bottom for you to be able to enter your email address and jump on our mailing list. And by doing that, you will, uh, every time we release an episode, you'll get an email with all the show notes and everything. So that's requirement number one. You have to be on the mailing list. Number two is that you have to submit a recording that is no more than 20 seconds long of you telling us why you like the Microsoft Cloud Show. 
what has been your most favorite episode? What has been the most memorable moment? What has been the funniest episode? What has been the worst episode? What has been the best interview? Those kinds of things. Make it interesting. Make it memorable. Put something on there. Go to our, once you've done that, grab your phone. You don't have to have a great microphone kit and everything to be able to record this. Pull out your iPhone or your Android phone or whatever, or you know the two people that are listening that sell Windows phones. Pull those out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't use it. Pull it out, do a little recording, throw it up in Dropbox or OneDrive or anywhere public that we can get to the file. And then if you go to our website and you click on the questions link, you can submit a question and there's a place where you can put the link in for where we can get the MP3 or the WAV file that you record. Somehow just get that thing to us by submitting that form and we'll acknowledge that we get it from you but we need to get your email address so we can make sure that your submission, you're also on the mailing list and we need to get the, the file from you. Yep. And just keep in mind, we want to make sure that it stays below 20 seconds so that we can, or below say 20, 30 seconds, something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So that we can, we have the ability to play it on the show because we want to play a bunch of these on the show. Yep. You want to make the link is in the top right hand corner of the, of the website. And if you click on the contact link, it takes you to a we form that basically asks you for your your name, your email address, and a message, obviously. And then at the bottom, there's a little field, which is where you paste the URL to your to your file. So ideally, send it to us as a WAV or an MP3 file, pretty much any audio file we can cope with. So whatever you happen to be able to record, drop it in the URL field there. Once you've posted it on Dropbox or OneDrive, and hit submit. And we'll get the uh, we'll get an email about it, and we'll take a we'll take a listen to them. Absolutely. And now remember, so got to be on the mailing list. Got to submit a file of you know you telling us something about the show that's going to be. I mean, God, make us laugh, right? Give us something that's going to be good enough to put on the show. You know, that's going to be interesting to put on the show here that we can so we can highlight it. And you know, and make sure you introduce yourself and how people can find you and stuff. Why you listen? What you get from the show? And why you listen every week? We'd love to hear about. Yeah, get creative, you know, have fun with, it. I don't know, whatever. So, you know, if you listen to it with a group, you know, get a bunch of your, your people that listen to it at, the, at your office, you know, you guys can all share on the proceeds for this. Now, here's the thing. Once we get these, the ones that CJ and I think are good enough to put on the show, right, we'll put them on, they'll be part of episode 200. And if you get your recording put on the show, CJ, we have a grand prize winner. And then we have two runner-ups that we're going to do. What is the grand prize winner going to get? So the one lucky grand prize winner of not only fame and fortune of being played on the Microsoft Cloud Show episode 200 that you can gloat to your friends and family about, but you will also walk away with one Microsoft Surface laptop that was announced, what, a week ago from when the show comes out? Something like that? Yeah, early May. Yes. So... Grand prize winner is going to walk away with a Surface, a brand spanking new Surface laptop. We guarantee it will be of minimum spec or higher. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We, and I'm not really sure. We, we debated this. We tried to figure out how we could go below a minimum spec, but I think we're just going to settle a minimum spec. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe we could take off some of the keys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is going to be prize winner number one. And let's just say... This is all going to come down to a judge's final decision and what we like the most. There's really no other criteria than that. However, we do have, for those who make the effort to submit one of these recordings about what you like about the show and so forth, and you get played on the show, we will also have two runner-up prizes of two brand spanking new Xbox One S bundles. We've yet to pick the bundle, but we will be doing that and sending them out to the runners-up as well. So be sure to use your real email address when you submit these because <laughs> we'll want to get in touch with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, there's also, there's also a wee caveat on these prizes in that if you're outside of the States and for whatever reason we can't get these to you, we will endeavor to send you a gift card for the Microsoft Store of equal value of what we would have spent on the prize and we will make it right for you. So fear not if you're in far-flung regions of Mongolia. We would love to hear from you. We will get you a, uh, a prize one way or another. Yeah, we won't be uh, breaking any export laws and shipping like a Surface laptop to North Korea or anything like that. So exactly. I'm not, I'm, I'm not... Last thing we want to do is cause World War Three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have to do that. I think everybody else, there's some other people having a grand old time doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We decided, look, like, Episode 200, this is a big milestone for us, man. I'm 
super proud that we're approaching number 200. And we wanted to do something special for our listeners because, you know, you guys make the show possible and make it worthwhile doing it every week. So we wanted to give back a little bit and have some fun on the show and uh, see what people think. It's one of our, it's kind of one of our, uh, one of the things we talk about a bunch on the show is it's really tough making these things because you don't talk to people face to face like you would at speaking com- at a conference or something. And so I think it's really cool that we'll, we'll have people submit yep. Uh, yep. submit recordings and tell us what they like because it would really, uh, really make us smile, I think. Oh, yeah. It'll be fun. We're trying to mix it up a bit. And I mean, the giveaway is going to be cool. And I'm sure, I mean, I, I'm thrilled that we are in a position that we can actually do this, but I'm, I'm more thrilled that I think that it's going to give us a much better chance at people submitting some really interesting stuff. And I'm sure that, you know, a bunch of people that we know are probably going to submit some stuff that's going to be funny. But I'm really eager to hear from the people who, you know, listen to the show, but we don't, we've never interacted with. The names are going to be completely new to us. Yes. I, that's, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think that'd be really fun. <laughs> so uh, I, I think listening to them, I, I mean, we may get deluged in these things, right? We may get a bunch of them. We're going to have to listen to all of them. And I bet there's going to be some... <laughs> Definitely crack up moments, I suspect. I'm sure we're going to get a few that we're not allowed to play on the air. <laughs> That's too. right. Yeah, keep it clean. If you want to end up on the show, we're not going to we're not going to be able to do a whole bunch of editing and bleeping you out. So, well, we can do some bleeping, but I think it, when it gets vulgar or something like that, I mean, I'd love to hear it, but I don't. Want, I don't <laughs> yeah. think I'm going to put that on the show. Try to try to keep it playable. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So there goes Jeremy's submissions. Jeremy takes submissions, but anyway. So. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey. So there's that. Now, there's another thing that we want to do before we do the news. Let me just real quick here. Hey, we're this is going to come out on uh, Tuesday, May the 9th. And what is coming out right after Tuesday, May the 9th? That's a Microsoft Build conference. I'm not going to be at Build. I will be watching from afar. But you and I are, I know you are going to be at Build. And yep. we are planning some, just like we've done in the past, some special coverage of Build. So you can expect your podcast uh, feed, like we did at Ignite, you're going to see at Ignite last year, you're going to see a bunch of additional episodes probably popping up at the end of the week, uh, this week when this comes out. So over the course of May the 10th, 11th, 12th, we may, depending on how many interviews we actually collect, we've already got one uh, that's going to talk about uh, some of the new stuff coming with the SharePoint framework. We did that with Vesa Uvenin, and that'll come out on, I believe on Wednesday, late in the day, East, Eastern Standard Time, Eastern yeah. Daylight Savings Time, whatever, EDT. That'll come out on on Wednesday afternoon, but we got other stuff. We're going to talk about the keynotes. You're going to be there doing a bunch of interviews with people. So a bunch of really cool stuff coming up. It's going to be a really busy week for me. Fortunately, Build is local this year, to me at least. So I don't have to travel to another city to do it. So that kind of makes it nice, but it's going to be a busy week. Yeah. And we're going to have some interviews lined up with folks. Uh, We're going to get some shows out uh, that week and tell you all about what is going on if you can't make it and get our impressions on those things. Absolutely. So, um, cool. So, CJ, you want to start diving into the news here? Yeah, exactly. Let's cover some items. Before we do the news, let's roll one of the clips from one of our sponsors and uh, whether they make the show possible. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. The Microsoft Cloud Show is sponsored by Valid.nl. Valid's motto is stay ahead. Its mission is to enable its customers to excel in their business through the innovative use of IT. Valid is always on the lookout for new colleagues. Are you interested in all things happening in Azure, whether in infrastructure, SQL Server, Office 365, BI, SharePoint, or .NET? Look them up on valid.nl. Awesome. So, CJ, I got a bunch of Microsoft news that I've collected here. When you were gone, I had some a bunch of news that I shared with people, and then I realized I've got way too much Microsoft news. Well, not way too much. I've just got a bunch of Microsoft news. So I figured, let's go through and let's start publishing some of this stuff out. And the first one... I thought was incredibly cool, very, very nice, is that Microsoft turned on two-factor authentication into one factor by ditching (laughs) passwords. So here's the way that this works. Well, theoretically, it's still two-factor. It's still two-factor, yeah. So what they did is they allowed you to get away from using passwords. So basically, if you have a Microsoft account, an MSA account, you can configure your account to no longer prompt you for the password when you log in. And instead, it just goes straight to the two factors. So you plug in your email address, and then you get a little ding on your phone and says, do I need to approve or you know reject it or something? Yeah, this is really cool. And actually, it's kind of funny because when, when I went to Microsoft and met with some of the guys and the auth team over there, I said, you know, what I really want is just the ability to put in my email address and then hit a button on my phone to log in. 
and they both looked at each other like, how come he knows about this? <laughs> and, and I had no idea it was coming. So yeah. this is really sweet. Technically, they, they said it was still considered two-factor because I think to do this with the Microsoft Authenticator app, you have to have Touch ID enabled on mm. iOS. Mm. So they, they consider this, you've got to have your username, you've got to have your fingerprint, and you've got to have the ability to use the app on the phone. So I think, and the notification, right? So the actual device. So I think that's that's still considered two-factor. Yeah, so you, yeah, so even though it's, uh, I guess, fingerprint or the user's finger, so either one will work. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Does Touch ID work with dead people's fingers? I don't know. Some of those biometric things don't. They've got to detect life. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's not try this. Maybe if no, I no, put no. a rubber band around my finger for long enough and try it out, <laughs> that's probably a bad idea. Anyway. Yeah, but you might have to see a doctor after that for four yeah. hours. <laughs> <laughs> my finger, I see. My finger. <laughs> How do you log into your phone? So another bit that we have here is, a, <laughs> is an announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, sliding. Uh, is a new Azure Media Player. It's a Media Player 2.0. What this is is that this is allowing allowing people to do a bunch of new stuff. So you can add in advertisements, which is kind of cool. To if you have your own media that you're streaming with the Azure Media Player, you can inject your own advertisements. I guess same, similar to how they do it on like YouTube. You can also go in and and uh, use one of the new skins that they have to provide as well. Uh, it's really cool because it's very easy to go through and to make a switch to using the new media player. Um, there's just a separate CSS reference that you have to make, or new CSS reference you make, and a uh, an update to the script for pointing to the new media player. They've also got a bunch of new plugins that you can take advantage of. It's a lot more accessible with more doing a better job and working with things like JAWS or Narr Narrator, which are assisted technologies for people who are visually impaired. Also, how to, you know, if you want to go through and navigate the player not using a mouse. You want to use like keyboard shortcuts or tab or something like that. That's all much improved with the new uh, the new media player. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. I'll have to check that out. I've got one here for the Azure Time Series Insights. So they're putting out a public Microsoft put out a public preview, point to the blog post, obviously, where they're announcing a new service called Time Series Insights. And my understanding of this is it's a you know time series database, for want of a better word. And basically, you pump it full of data, and data that's specifically time series based. So this could be events that are happening in a particular application or in a you know series set of devices from around the world, that sort of thing. It's specifically targeted in the IoT space. So you can imagine you've got thousands of devices or millions of devices out there, and they're all sending telemetry data back in. They would all come in through like the Azure IoT Hub or the Azure Event Hub, for example, into this Time Series Insights database where you can do some really interesting reporting and analytics over the top of it um, and see what's going on. And it makes it possible to sort of to reason over, you know, billions of data points really quickly and easily and specifically targeted at kind of event type data that happens over a period of time. So that's out in public preview in Azure. Mm, very nice. Uh, another quick one that we have here is uh, announcing new services in the United Kingdom for Azure. Mm. Three main services that have been added to the offering that we have over in the United Kingdom that we have, we currently have inside the, in a lot of other regions within the United States and other regions throughout the world. But the three big ones are HD Insight is now available. Azure Import Export is now live in UK South, which is the ability to move lots of data from on premises to the cloud. And it does that by you use a, like a, a disk, a, a physical disk that you put all the data on, it's encrypted, it's all secured, and then you mail it using a secure fashion like FedEx or UPS mm -hmm. to the data center. They load it in a storage account using the keys that they that you've provided them, and it just helps you from having to upload terabytes of data over your bandwidth instead of just shipping it. Gotcha. And the other one that they've added too, which is very nice, is the Azure Container Registry, the private registry for hosting mm. container images that is now available inside of the UK data centers. Yeah, that's really nice. I've got another one here. Azure Analysis Services is generally available. Uh, there's an announcement here at, this came out on April the 19th, so it's, it's a couple of weeks old now, but uh, there was an event called the Data Amp Event where 
Azure announced the GA of Azure Analysis Services. And this is a service that's, um, if you're familiar with OLAP engines for reporting and dicing and slicing of data from things like SQL Server Analysis Services, this is based on that, but in a PaaS manner. So you can go buy an OLAP engine from Microsoft and Azure through Platform as a Service and be able to pump your data in, model it, and uh, and then obviously go do interesting slicing and dicing and reporting over it for BI-type scenarios, things like that. So um, that went GA is available. Yes. Very nice. Hmm. So another thing that came out, uh, this happened at the end of April, is that Microsoft announced their quarterly earnings uh, number. The title of the article is, They Meet Expectations with $23.6 billion in Revenue, and Azure Revenue is up 93%. So get this. Um, they beat the street. Beat the street was expecting earnings per share coming in around 70 cents. They actually came in at 73 cents. But I thought that the part that was really interesting about this was that, like, they, like I said in the title, Azure revenue was up 93%. It's a number that was driven by both increased demand for the cloud and Azure Compute Services, as well as the premium services. Microsoft's intelligent cloud run rate is now 15.2 billion, which puts it on track to hit the 20 billion run rate Microsoft has long expected to achieve by 2020. There's a lot of stuff from this. It also is the first full quarter since Microsoft's massive $26 billion acquisition of LinkedIn. Once that, well, that acquisition closed, uh, it's the first time they've done that. The productivity segment is still dominated by revenue from products like Office 365 and Dynamics. So Microsoft reported revenue of $8 billion for this group compared to $6.5 billion just a year ago. That's covering Office 365 and Dynamics. So really strong growth for Microsoft in the cloud in this, in this last quarterly report. Smashing it. Crushing it. Doing really well. Crushing it. Cognitive services is generally available for Face API, Computer Vision API, and Content Moderator. So again, this came from that same Data Amp event that they've recently had. And if you're not familiar with cognitive services, there's some really cool stuff in there. It's basically a set of APIs that you can call that do really interesting things that would be hard to do by yourselves. So like uh, we use it at Hyperfish for doing human face detection and profile photos. And they have a face API that you could basically send it a picture and you can say, I'm interested in these kinds of things. And it will tell you, you know, is there somebody in the photo? How many people are in there? All that sort of stuff. It's really straightforward to use and it's pretty, pretty cool. Also, you can say, are they happy, sad, angry, all that sort of stuff. There's emotion, emotion type detection in there as well. Mm. So if that's face API, computer vision API, you can basically send it things and say, hey, what's in this image? And the example that they give is they send it a photo, strangely enough, of the Colosseum in Rome. <laughs> I didn't write this API, this blog post, but. <laughs> Maybe one of the guys I was standing there, one of the, one of the people at the Coliseum I was standing next to was one, <laughs> an Azure blog post writer. Yeah. So they use an example of sending out a photo of the inside of the Coliseum from standing up on one of the things, taking a photo, sending that, that, and it comes back and says, oh, yeah, it's the Coliseum. That's really cool. So um, it can detect what's in the image, create sort of tags based on what's in there of objects that it identifies, people and celebrities and, you know, things like that. And so you can uh, you can tell what, what an image is about. So when you say, send me a photo of your cat, you could put it in this API and you could automatically detect if it was actually a cat. And then the other one that they mention here is Content Moderator, which provides machine-assisted moderation of text and images augmented with human review tools. Video moderation is available in preview. So this is basically to stop people uploading really dodgy stuff, swearing in text, uploading, nudie selfies, all those sorts of things. Yeah, this is we, we got a bunch of links to this in the show notes here because there was the main article that they had when they published this stuff. But then they also have a couple of deep dives into the speech and video APIs from Project Oxford, a Microsoft project, and then also the Face API. So we've been talking also to um, a good friend of ours, Sonia Koptev, who's recently joined the Cognitive Services team. And we, we are in the future, in the next few months, you'll hear a bit of a series that we're going to run too on cognitive services and learning more about it. It's very cool stuff with all this machine learning and AI stuff that we really want to dive into and kind of share what they're doing. But we want to make sure we plan this out because this is, I mean, like for me, this stuff is, is brand new and it's, I don't, I don't get it all. And so it's, uh, I want to make sure that we, that if they can explain it to me, then I'm sure that they can explain it to everybody else. And so we're going to kind of stage this out and plan this, this series out kind of like we did our, 
container stuff a couple months ago. Nice. I've got a couple things here that are related to uh, data. So I've got three items here. Document DB Data Explorer. A mm-hmm. preview is now available in the portal. So easier to look at your data inside the Document DB from the Azure portal. Nice. Also now by default, all newly created SQL Azure, sorry, Azure SQL databases will be encrypted at rest by default. That's a very nice feature. And then the last one is a new Power BI content pack for enterprise users. Now, I saw this one actually in the last day or two. What this does is it's going to allow you to, if you've seen what they've done in the past around creating a Power BI dashboard around analyzing your Azure spend, this kind of extends that, takes it to the next level. So they added a content pack to help you with different visualizations. It actually shows you price changes and stuff. It's very, very slick. Uh, I was actually, I was, when I saw this, I was thinking about you guys because I know that you, you've got multiple Azure subscriptions mm. that you're trying to track and this might, this might be something that helps you a bit. Yeah, nice. I'll definitely have to check that out. Speaking of Power BI, they came out with news recently that they're changing some of the packaging and licensing and skewing of Power BI. So um, they are apparently doing quite well. But there was some confusion that the free version of Power BI lacked a bunch of the functionality that the Power BI Pro, I think they call it, had. And so they're changing some of that. So now the Power BI free version is going to have many of the same capabilities about what data sources and things you can connect to and the refresh cycles for going and getting that data and stuff. But what they've done is pretty controversial. Obviously, they're not going to give all of this away for free. So they're taking some things away. And one of the things they're taking away, unfortunately, in the free version is the ability to share dashboards with other people. Mm. So they're taking away a bunch of the ability to go build a dashboard and then go share it out with others, from my understanding, which (laughs) is causing a little, quite a few ripples. It's funny they say that too, because I've even got the paid version and you and I are trying to share dashboards with the podcast stuff and you and I can't even get it shared and we both pay for it. (laughs) Dude, don't get me started. (laughs) If anybody from the Power BI team is listening to this show, please come on, because Power BI to me is one of the most infuriating products I've used from Microsoft in quite some time. It's just, I find it completely unintuitive to, I'm a noob, right? So this is this is totally, you know, on me, but I just find it really, really hard to use. And like our example of paid Power BI, <laughs> Power BI, yeah. you tried to share a dashboard with me, and for the love of all things holy in the world, I cannot get in there. I don't think that what we're doing is all that special. Now, granted, there, we do have one little one interesting caveat, which is I have an E5 license, you have an E5 license, but we're in different tenants in Office 365. Yeah, but and I get that we're both on Mac, so I mean, really, my my Surface has turned into a nice paperweight slash OneNote slash uh, Power BI client. Because we don't have any kind of a Mac kind of experience there, which which really that's one thing I wish they would really take it would really look at and consider making a Mac client for this. But we have data sources coming from Azure SQL database and a couple different spreadsheets. And all we want to do is we're just trying to look at the stats from our blog from our, our blog, from our, our podcast. And I've got it set up on mine, and then I publish it, and I publish it inside of a, a site. And then I are inside of an Office 365 site that I've given you access to, and you can get to it. And it says when I want to share it, put his email address in, and you don't ever see it. And yep. you get the invite, you go to it, but you can't get access to it. Even when you open up the dashboard, all the connections it's made are all relative links to stuff that's on my machine, even though the dashboard is pulling from spreadsheets in the exact same folder. And so it all screws up on your machine. So when you go to tweak it to go make the changes to it, it screws up on my machine, and it's like, I'm not a data guy. I'm a, I, I like to slice and dice data. I'm not some analytics junkie, mm, but mm. it can't be this hard. I've got to think that there's, first of all, if it, if it was all done as a web tool and I could just easily share it in a web tool, that's great. But I'm getting really close to just saying, you know what, forget it. I'm going to go take a look at Tableau again and just be like, it's a web experience. That's all I really want. Yeah, yeah. I would rather run around stabbing myself in the face with a pencil than try and update a Power BI dashboard. And you know what? You and I, may we may not be getting it, and there may be something totally wrong with what we're doing, and yep. there may be something that's very simple, and I would, if somebody knows the easy way to do it, come on the show. John White is a big Power BI guy. He's actually a very tall Power BI guy. And come on the show and walk us through, explain what we're doing wrong, what's so hard about it. And if and frankly, if we're doing it right and you can't do that, that's ridiculous. This is not, this should not be that hard. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, so yeah. if you are listening and you're on the Power BI team, 
we would love to have you on the show. Promise, we're really friendly and we don't buy it all that much other than mocking your product just a little bit. <laughs> it's open feedback. I would love to be proven wrong. And, I, if it, and if I'm not the only one. You're not the only one. We've talked to other people that are like this as well. Here's an opportunity to kind of clear it up and let's get it, let's get it resolved. Definitely. Uh, let's see what other news we have. I got one. I have one last thing here. I don't know if you have anything else, but it's a uh, service fabric. The .NET SDK goes open source. Mm. That's all I got. You got any other news for our listeners? Nope. I'm out. Okay, so <laughs> we've got a, that's a boatload of news that all those links are going to be in the show notes. So you can go take a look at it there. However, we're not done yet. We want to do picks. But before we do picks, yes. I'd like to just stop for just a second and have another uh, our sponsors step in a bit and help us support the show. While many IT teams struggle with the impact of deploying Office 365, Zscaler customers are experiencing 40% or greater network performance across file download times as well as TCP and DNS connection times compared to using next-gen firewalls and UTMs to route Office 365 traffic locally to the internet. While you may know Zscaler as the leader in cloud security, they also have hundreds of customers who are processing over 1.2 petabytes of Office 365 traffic monthly through the Zscaler cloud. Visit www.zscaler.com to learn more. Mr. Johnson, you got any picks for me? This I, Well, sorry, I know you do. We're going to have... I've got four picks, but I got a pretty good feeling that I'm not going to be able to use all of them because I think that you're that you either have you're using at least one, if not two of them. Well, no, I've definitely I think I've only got one of them. Okay, maybe two. I don't know. I've only got two picks. Okay, let's go with our shared pick first. Shared pick. Okay, because the shared pick, I think it's fair to say that this is not going to be a surprise to anybody that we've got this pick. No. Not at all. Well, considering both of our Facebook walls were lit up the day that it came out. Yeah. So Lego are coming out with the NASA Apollo Saturn V set. Oh. oh, yeah. So sweet. When is it available? It is available on June the 11th. Oh, sorry. June the 1st, 2017. No, June the 2nd. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. It says listed here June the 1st. Okay, June the 2nd. No, no, no. No, no, everyone needs to know it's June the 2nd so that I can get in order on June the 1st and oh, then everybody else can jump in. <laughs> Classy. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, excellent. Uh, PST or EST, I don't know. It's going to be lines at the Lego store, that's for sure. I'm starting um, at UTC. <laughs> and it's and it's going to be $119.99. $119. It is a thing of glory. This Now, the cool thing about this set, right, as you well know, but for our listeners who are not as schnurfy and geeky as we are, may not know, this was submitted as an idea from the community of these guys that built this set and submitted it as a Lego idea through the Ideas website. And have I've been watching it over the last probably 12 months at least, it's probably longer since they submitted it. It's been mm. a long road. And watching it as it goes through, and it got accepted by Lego. There were lots of votes for it and all that sort of stuff. And now this is the final product that Lego have decided to ship as a real Lego set. And um, it's a, a 1 to 110 scale replica of the rocket. Obviously, it comes in three parts, sorry, four or five parts, actually. It's hard to describe how many pieces, but it's staged. Obviously, you've got all the stages of the rocket. It's got the lunar lander in there. It's got the command and service modules. It can lie flat on a stand that it comes with, or it can stand up. It's over three feet or one meter tall. So it's kind of huge. Yeah, and, and a nice little touch. Yes. A very nice little touch here that I don't think people are really picking up on this, but it's one, it's the, I think it is either the tallest or one of the tallest Legos ever. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny about this too, because we, there was a, a picture floating around on Facebook of a giant aircraft carrier that somebody made with Lego. Mm. I don't know if you saw this about a month ago. No. And in the background, I'm looking at it and I just see this tall white tower and I'm like looking at the corner of the picture. And I'm like, that's the Saturn V rocket. They, it, that's a prototype of the rock. Somebody had already had it out. Their Lego had already just put it on display. But it's also one of the most pieces of a Lego. But how many pieces is it, CJ? 1,969. CJ, what year did we land on the moon? 1,969. 1969. <laughs> that is awesome. That's so well done. And I'm sure I'm just going to have an extra little, like, you know, one by one square. <laughs> Just yeah, to get exactly. the 1,169. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be pissed. You'll be pissed if you lose a piece. But you know what they should? I think what they should have done is not told people how many pieces, and they should have kept that a secret until the boxes hit the shelves. And then you rock up and you see the box and you see 1969, and you're like, "Why did they put the year on it?" Oh, that's awesome. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, 
that is super cool. I will definitely be buying two of these things. Yeah, I can't wait to get it. I'm genuinely surprised. I expected this to come in about the same price as the Death Star. I thought it was going to be ballpark 400 bucks. So coming in at 120 Yeah, nice for little. sure. I mean, it's cylindrical and it's tall. It's actually a pretty basic model, all things considered. But it's going to be a thing of beauty. Yeah, I love how you can do the stand. You can break it up into three sections and having it on the stand. So that will be... I've already have to start planning the reorganization of my Lego shelf behind my desk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the decisions, the decisions. So yes, okay. that's our shared pick. That's our shared pick. What do you got? I'm going to stay with the space theme. Mm. Uh, actually, no, hold on a minute. I'm going to stay with the Lego theme. Mm. And I'm going to share a link here from a blogger named Jacques Math. I'm going to mess this up. Mathios? Matage? I'm not sure. Anyway, he has a post where what he has done is he has taken done some image recognition, conveyor belt, and some other stuff. And he has a solution that he has built to sort two metric tons of Lego. I'm very disappointed in the fact that he actually spelled Lego, capital L, lowercase E-G-O. But he still, <laughs> which is not correct, it's all, it's, there's no singular or plural of Lego. It's always capital L-E-G-O, all capitals, gotcha. all caps. But anyway. Not Legos. It's the same as Speedo. Mm -hmm. You wear a Speedo and you have a pair of Speedo. Or you have a whole bag of Speedo that just got delivered. That's right. But mm -hmm. you'd never wear Speedos. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, anyway. you probably should because they're so small, but that's okay. You never, no, so, it's never okay to wear Speedos. Yeah, well, <laughs> unless you're, yeah. unless you're a, slum, a swimmer, but anyway. So, uh, yeah, this is pretty cool because the guy's got a video showing, uh, showing the link of this, uh, showing his, his prototype actually working. It's got a cool little conveyor belt well, where it pulls the Legos up and then it drops it down, hits, goes through a, a light. He takes a picture of it. It recognizes where, where, what kind of a Lego it is within, I think, like 50 milliseconds. Yeah, 50 milliseconds. And it goes down a conveyor belt and then he has these little nozzles that are blowing compressed air that are throwing it into a bucket. Now, it's a prototype. It goes, it's running very slow going through two metric tons of Lego. This is going to take him, I think, years to sort the thing out. But he says it can run much faster than it is. He, it also, he needs a bigger conveyor belt to be able to have different places of where it's going to go. Different buckets, yeah. In the blog post, he talks about how many different permutations or of different sizes and color of Lego there are that you have to sort out. So it was... It was pretty cool. That's amazing. I got to see that video. That's cool. I will share it. I think spouses and partners who've had to sift through Lego boxes, as I know your wife has had to, to do before because she's espoused the virtues of how painful it is on Facebook, will attest to that one of these machines would be awesome. Oh, yeah. It'd be fun to build one. I'd love to, I'd love to build one. But it's cool. It's easy. It goes with like image recognition, goes with like, you know, hardware stuff. It's really cool. It's nice. All right. How about you? Okay. So I was introduced to this concept of this credit card called Final, which is a credit card built for the 21st century. For those of you who don't live in the States, you can probably tune out at this point because you have <laughs> modern banking. But here in the US, <laughs> we're stuck with credit cards and checks. And the problem with credit cards here is you don't need PIN numbers on them. You can use them anywhere. You don't even need chips. You still got the magnetic swipe thing. It's like living in the dark ages. And the zero security around them. And it's a royal pain in the ass because approximately once a year, my credit card gets blocked because of fraudulent activity. And that's basically because you're being a dirty, promiscuous person with your credit card all around the world. And sure enough, like people either take swipe your number or what have you and start using it. Apparently, I was trying to buy like 20 tons of concrete in Mexico at some point. But anywho, so Final is a new credit card where you, it's all done through a website and you can create as many numbers as you want, and you can lock them to individual vendors, or you can create them as one-time purchase numbers. So you can say, hey, Netflix, here's a, here's a credit card number you should use, and it's only locked to Netflix, which is pretty cool. And you can ax them at any time, so you can wipe them, you can get rid of them. They'll send you a physical card as well, so you can use it on a trip. Uh, you go use it on a trip or whatever, get back from the trip, and cancel it and get a new one. And um, so it's kind of like a disposable credit card number system. It's pretty sweet. Mm, that's very sweet. Yeah, very nice. Okay, I'm going to go back. I have another one that I'm going to stick with my... I'm going to go back to the space theme. So we started it with space and Lego. I switched over to Lego. I'm going to go back to space. And then I actually just had an honorable mention that just showed up on my phone that I'm going to read to you that I think you're going to go crazy over. Okay, perfect. My next one is the... Chinese and European space agencies are in talks to build a moon base right now. Ooh. Yeah. So it's really, I mean, that's, that's the gist of it. There's nothing else in the article, but that's pretty cool. I mean, it's like, let's see. I, I love to see these other 
space agencies outside of the United States, outside of SpaceX, outside of the ULA. Love to see them, what they're doing as well, and kind of pushing absolutely pushing stuff further. So Yeah, definitely. That'll be really cool. And if the Chinese are going there, then the Americans may be a little more interested in going there. So mm-hmm. we will see. It might create a new moon race. That'll be pretty sweet. Exactly. Now, do you have any other picks? No, I'm done. Okay, so my fourth pick, my fourth and final official pick before my honorable mention is a TED Talk that mm. was came out last week. It was done by um, Elon Musk. Oh, yeah, I saw this. The title of TED Talk is The Future We Are Building and Boring. Now, the talk was quite interesting. I'm a big fanboy of Elon Musk of what he's doing and everything about him. There's a lot of stuff. That, personally, I think he guy's a jerk, but it doesn't really, the same way with Steve Jobs. But what he's doing, you can't deny what he's what he's adding to the, what he's doing for the world. Mm. The talk is about 50 minutes long or 45 minutes long, something like that. It starts off talking about his idea of digging tunnels in Los Angeles. He pivots over to talk about Tesla, to talk about energy, to talk about all this different stuff, talk about space. It's an absolutely fantastic interview. And I think it does a really good job. It wasn't so much of an interview as a structured way to get Elon to talk about stuff because yeah. he doesn't, he's not exactly the most organized thought presenter. No. But if you want to go for the money shot to me, it's go look at, go start watching it about 35 minutes and 30 seconds. The interviewer asks Elon, you know, why do this with all the other stuff that we have to do and everything? Why go to Mars? Why even do it? And he, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I love the point that he makes about technology and technology degrading and how you have to keep pushing stuff. And I absolutely loved it. And, you know, to all the people that think that he's trying to do this for like fame and fortune, I don't think he's doing that. I think he's doing it because he believes it's right. And he said something like, I'm not trying to be the savior. I'm just trying to do the right thing and make people not sad or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's basic sort of, you know, these weren't his exact words, right? But what I took away from it was he was like, if this is it, that kind of bums me out. Yeah. <laughs> and so he wants to keep pushing, which I think is yeah. admirable. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, without, really cool. without government money. That's the cool thing, too. He's doing it without government money. Yeah, exactly. All right. My honorable mention, last thing I'll give you, and then, we gotta, then we'll cut it off. Sure. All right. I'm going to skip the title of this. I'm just going to go ahead and start reading it. McLaren. Oh, nice. Got your attention. I knew that would do that. McLaren have announced a new esports motor racing competition, the winner of which will be offered a position as one of the team's official F1 simulation drivers. The format, dubbed World Fastest Gamer, will pit the best gamers in the world against multiple racing platforms as they battle each other to discover the ultimate champion of champions. Quoted from McLaren's Zach Brown, their winner will genuinely be a key part of our team at McLaren. This is for real. The victor will be offered a one-year contract with McLaren, working with engineers at both the team's UK factory at and at Grand Prix circuits around the world to develop and improve the machinery driven by Fernando Fernando Alonso and Van der Drom. The only downside to this is still using a Honda. But, I mean, still, this is really... (laughs) (laughs) Wow. That is very cool. Isn't that awesome? I'll put that link in the show notes. But I'm sitting here, and as you were doing your pick with the credit card, I just, my phone just kind of chips over and I look over and it was a, an F1 alert. And I was like, what is that? And like McLaren to offer F1 simulator role to eSports prize winner. I thought I was going to get a chance to have an F1 simulator at my house. Yeah, I'm cool with going and using theirs. I'm okay with that too. That's pretty cool, man. So all of these hours that I've been, been putting in in Forza with the, uh, with the Lotus F1 or Renault F1 car around Spa is finally mm. going to come to fruition. All I can hope is, is that they use Spa as the track for testing. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> you're going to work. <laughs> the number of no laps in I've put at Spa on the on the Xbox is is <laughs> quite substantial. <laughs> yeah. Spa and uh, what is it? Spa and Coda for me. Those are those yeah. two. Yeah, I think anyway. I, I intimately know every corner of Spa, so maybe I'll enter. <laughs> I'm too slow and old for that to win this, but uh, it'll be pretty fun. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'll have that link in the show notes. Wow, that's cool. That is yeah. really cool. Cool, man. Oh man, I'm already jealous of whoever wins that. Yeah, no, that'd be really cool to see the results of that. So it's a uh, it's a fun racing month, man. We're seeing Fern- Fernando coming over racing at Indy. We saw him yeah. do. Uh, did a test yesterday. Test yesterday. The double bird strike. I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't see that. Oh, oh he had there go. Yeah, just do a double bird. Alonso double bird strike. There were two birds on the track that started to fly away from him, and they both hit like the front part of the wheels. And let's just say the birds didn't suffer. Yeah, they just they were just suddenly a bloody cloud. Yeah, and then 
<laughs> just for you because he's a down under guy. That's unfortunate. Go do a search for uh, Will Powers Double Bird Strike as well. Okay, I'll have a look. Yeah, his wasn't so much the car variety. His was more of the finger variety. <laughs> I'll definitely check that out. Hey, we should probably wrap this up. It's, yeah. We've been waffling on for an hour. No, oh, we have, we have. Hey, great show, man. Uh, a lot of news there and... Don't forget, episode 200, send us your submissions. We want to send you some cool kit. Absolutely. Get them in. We would love to play your segment on the show and have a good laugh. So uh, definitely go and do that. Great prizes. Episode 200, rapidly approaching. And stay tuned for a whole bunch of build news. Absolutely. Take care, CJ. See ya. Did you like this episode? Please tweet about it and drop a five-star review in iTunes. Word of mouth recommendations are the most effective ways for us to grow the show, and we'd really appreciate it. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a wave or an MP3 and provide a link so that we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is brought to you by Keith Ritchie. For more information on Keith Music, head to music.kritchie.com. You can subscribe to us on iTunes in the Google Play Store by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find notes of each episode. You can also find us on Facebook, searching for Microsoft Cloud Show, or on Twitter, at MS Cloud Show. And finally, sign up to our mailing list by heading over to our website and entering your email to interact with us, participate in upcoming interviews, and other cool stuff. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.